Happy New Year's everyone. So the year is now 2022 and for the past few years I felt this general apocalyptic sentiment that the world is falling apart. It feels like the government's lying to us, that we can't trust our institutions anymore, that truth and justice used to exist back in the good old days, but nowadays we're all doomed and everything's just going to hell. And if you're on social media, this is definitely the overall atmosphere. No one focuses on the good and all you hear about is how bad everything's gotten. And if you don't take an objective stance and look at the facts, you might start to believe that the world is way worse off than it used to be. However, this is factually untrue. In his book, Harvard professor Steven Pinker shows how global health, standard of living, happiness, and safety as a whole are actually increasing, not decreasing, if you look at the numbers. And this is a result of scientific thinking and reason, which has radically pushed society forward. Here are five reasons why 2022 is the best year ever, and now is the best time ever to have been alive. If you had to choose any moment in history, you'd choose right now. This is a video on why you should be optimistic for the future. Before I begin, I want to make a caveat about the last few years. This book was published in 2018 before the COVID-19 pandemic. Recently, some of these numbers have gone back up, specifically related to death rates, crime and murder rates, etc. However, these are just outliers. Every couple of years, some crazy event will occur, which changes the trends back in the opposite direction, but usually everything normals out, which will happen in this case too. Most likely, once the pandemic is over, these trends will reorient themselves. Anyway, timestamps are in the description. Let's begin. The first point Pinker makes is the fact that intellectuals, specifically progressives, hate the idea of progress. They don't hate the fruits of progress, specifically the internet, vaccines, and desegregation, but they hate acknowledging that significant progress has been made. And this is a result of a whole host of cognitive biases. First of all, you have the optimism gap. The optimism gap is this fallacy where people see their own lives as this triumphant success, but they see the average person's life as really shitty. If you poll people and ask them if their own economic situation is going to be better in the upcoming year, they'll probably say yes. But if you ask the same people about their country's economic situation, they usually say it's going to get much worse. People think drugs, littering, unemployment, and crime is all getting worse in their society as a whole, but not in their neighborhood. Their community is getting better. When asked about it, most people think the world is going downhill, but their own lives are improving. The optimism gap exists for several reasons. First of all, as humans, we have a natural tendency to focus on the bad. Evolutionarily speaking, this makes sense. According to the concept of entropy, there are so many more ways for things to go wrong than there are for them to go right. Probabilistically speaking, it is much more likely as a whole for things to go wrong than right. So our biology is naturally tuned to focus on the bad, how things could fall apart, rather than how things are improving. People care way more about losing what they have than gaining more. Another reason why people think the world is going to hell is because of the availability bias and social media. Social media always focuses on things that go wrong. This is because the news only talks about things that happen, not things that don't happen. CNN will never say a war didn't break out in this country. Fox News is not gonna be like, a forest fire wasn't started this week. News always talks about the sudden start of something drastic, which is usually something bad. Bad things often happen very quickly, like school shootings or tornadoes. But good things, like the increase of life expectancy over the past century, is not anything anyone would click on. This plays directly into the availability bias, which is the fact that people estimate the probability of an event by the number of examples that come to mind. Let me ask you a question. Are there more words that start with K in the English language, or more words which have K as the third letter in the English language? Most people say more words start with K, but that's actually wrong. Words like bake, take, make, or cake are way more common. But it's easier to think of words that start with a letter, which is why people think there's more of them. As the percent of stories that make it onto Instagram or go viral on Twitter are much more likely to be negative than positive, even if this doesn't actually reflect reality. And if all you do is get your news from social media, you're gonna think the world is going to hell. This is why to actually understand what's going on, you need to take a quantitative approach. If you wanna find out if racism is going up, you can't just judge it based off of the number of police shootings you can think of. You need to try to factually measure the amount of racism over time to see if it's going down. And spoiler, it is. So that's the availability bias and why social media makes it seem like everything is much worse. Now I'm going to talk about some ways that things are actually getting better. Now these are just a few examples. There are way more ways that the world is getting better, but you'll have to read the full book to learn about those. We'll start with life, meaning life expectancy and health, which are two wonders of the modern world. First of all, life expectancy. This is a graph that shows life expectancy over the past few centuries in a few different continents. Okay, first of all, just 
take this in. People are living much, much longer than they were just a century ago. Imagine if this graph accelerates and picks up even more speed, we may reach a point where people are living longer than they're aging. Or in other words, the average life expectancy would be increasing more than one year every single year. Just take this in, your life is twice as long as it would have been if you were born just a hundred years ago. That's insane. Bloody hell. Why are we not celebrating this every single day, the fact that we're living so much longer? Now one reason why this graph is increasing so much is because of the rapid decrease in child mortality, which would bring the average really far down. A hundred years ago, child mortality was almost 50% in some areas. In other words, half of everyone died before reaching adulthood. And now you know what the rate is? It plunged and went down a hundredfold. Nowadays, child mortality is less than 1% in most developed countries thanks to modern medicine. A century ago, if you were a parent, you'd lose half your kids. Now most parents never have to go through that tragedy. That's just incredible. But even if you remove child mortality from the picture, people are living much, much longer. The average age in the 1850s after people left infancy was 47. Now it's in the 80s. These increases in life are mainly a result of modern medicine, which is something we should appreciate more often. In the past, infectious disease was the merchant of death. Epidemics killed millions of people and would wipe out entire civilizations. People used to die gruesome deaths due to disease. There are reports of people during an 1878 Memphis epidemic who crawled into holes, twisted out of shape, their bodies discovered later only by the stench of their decaying flesh. In the past, people blamed disease on God punishing humanity, using nonsense remedies like prayer, sacrifice, and bloodletting. But because of a series of miraculous advancements like vaccination, the acceptance of germ theory in hand washing, antibiotics, and the protection of drinking water through sewage management, billions, billions of lives were saved. Let me just paint a picture of the gruesome 1800s. There was feces, literal human waste, everywhere on the streets. Rivers and lakes were full of it, and people used to drink it and wash their clothes in this brown, murky water. Doctors used to treat people with literal human shit on them, never washing their hands even once. Nowadays, no one really appreciates the people who create created the life-saving techniques that launched us into modern society. Ever heard of Carl Landsteiner? Dude saved a billion lives by discovering blood groups. A billion, and there are so many more examples of these. You have Abel Wollman, who saved 177 million lives by discovering the chlorination of water. William Foge, 130 million lives by eradicating smallpox. And the list goes on. Researchers estimate, and this is a lowball, that five billion lives were saved through modern medicine and these techniques. So the next time you complain about the COVID vaccine or the pharmaceutical companies, think again. Modern medicine has transformed life as we know it and we should appreciate it more often. Another area where the world has gotten so much better is within safety and violence. Back in the day, early humans were killed all the time by random things such as snakes, spiders, insects. They used to be poisoned by toxic food. People would fall out of trees and die. They drown in rivers. And even if nature didn't kill people, people killed people all the time. However, deaths due to violence and accidents are going way down, luckily. First of all, excluding the world wars, more people are killed through homicide than in wars. People would just randomly kill each other. They'd fight in duels, bandits would randomly rob you and kill everyone, nobles would have each other assassinated, this happened all the time. But due to the enlightenment and modern ideals, people decided to stop murdering and start talking instead. Now we have police, a court system, laws, justice. Society has ways of dealing with issues so people don't just randomly duel to the death. And it's getting better every year. Homicide rates have been cut in half since the 80s. And the thing about homicide and violent crime is that it's a solvable problem. Yeah, you'll never eliminate 100% of homicides. There are always crazy people after all. But the thing about homicide is that it follows the 80-20 rule, meaning the majority of deaths are concentrated in a few key areas. Homicide rates in the most dangerous countries like Honduras, Venezuela, and El Salvador are hundreds of times the rates of safer countries. A quarter of the world's homicides occur in just four countries, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela. You probably shouldn't travel there. And even within those countries, it's concentrated in a few specific cities, and in those cities, a few key neighborhoods, and in those neighborhoods, a few murder blocks, and even further, in those blocks, they're all committed by the same people. If you can get these people off the street and behind bars, you solve the majority of the issue. What about solutions to violent crime? A lot of people claim that if you solve problems such as wealth, inequality, and racism, violent crime will take care of itself. But that's not necessarily true, and it's really difficult to implement. There are certain periods of time with 
really low inequality, but massive violence, like the 60s compared with the 30s, which had massive inequality but low violence. Contrary to popular belief, the best way to stop homicides and violent crime is to actually have strong law enforcement or police. Hear me out. Thomas Hobbes, who was an Enlightenment thinker, argued that the most dangerous areas are zones of anarchy. Think about it this way. If you have no government, no laws or regulations, the only way to enforce anything is through violence. This is why so many deaths are related to gang violence, which is connected with drug trafficking. If some dealer steps onto your turf or copies your formula, it's not like you can sue them for copyright infringement. You take it into your own hands, get a gang together, and murder them. There's a reason your local Walmart doesn't kill the manager of the local target down the street. Or Elon doesn't shoot Bezos. Jeff who? It's because these institutions are protected under the law, i.e. the police. If you have corrupt or non-existent police presence, crime skyrockets. The best way to solve violent crime is to increase legitimate law enforcement, victim protection, moderate punishment, and humane prisons. We need police officers, non-corrupt and ethical police officers. The keyword is legitimate authority. If you concentrate fair and respected police officers in these murder capitals, crime drastically decreases. Another way to decrease crime is to make crime much more difficult. Criminals are a product of impulsiveness. Most people who commit crimes such as murder, theft, and vandalism don't necessarily plan it out beforehand. Thus, if houses are harder to break into, people carry credit cards rather than cash, dark alleys are lit and monitored, people commit less crimes because they're harder to commit. You're less likely to get murdered in a well-lit public mall surrounded by police officers. Another area where the world has gotten much better is related to equal rights, something the media has gotten very wrong. Sexism, racism, homophobia. If you look at the facts, those are all way down compared to the rest of history. Yes, we definitely have a long way to go, but by and large, society is much more equal. First off, racism. The availability bias makes it seem like racism is on the up, with police killings of unarmed black men hitting the news much more often. But actually, if you look at the facts, police shootings are down. And three independent analyses have shown that someone's race doesn't increase the chance that they'll be killed by the police. When I read this, I was just as shocked as you probably are. But the facts check out and the media has painted a completely backwards narrative. So how do we actually measure racism, especially if it's internal private racism, sexism, or homophobia? Well, the economist Seth Stevens Davidowitz discovered that a good indicator of secret prejudice within an area is analyzing Google search data, specifically Google searches for the N-word and other sexist or homophobic slurs. According to this data, offensive searches are actually going down. Bigoted searches are much more likely to occur from older and less educated areas. Surprisingly, retirement communities are seven times more likely to search n-word jokes than the average. This data clearly shows how implicit bias is going down, with every generation discussing and using those terms less often. Other metrics that show the drastic increase in equal rights is the drastic decrease of poverty, increase in life expectancy, and literacy among black people. Black people who make it to 65 actually live longer than their white counterparts. Race-motivated violence is also going down. Since the FBI started tracking hate crimes, they've been steadily decreasing among members of every race. Violence against women is also drastically decreasing, and the sentiment around sexual assault has changed radically to protect the victim. In the past, women couldn't even press rape charges against their husbands, something that has drastically changed. Even worldwide, data supports these trends. A hundred years ago, women could only vote in one country, New Zealand, and now they could vote in every country except one, which is Vatican City. Gay rights are also at an all-time high. Homosexuality used to be a criminal offense in almost every country, yet because of the Enlightenment ideals like personal freedom, privacy, and consent, homosexuality has been decriminalized in many countries. Finally, let's talk about happiness. Do any of these changes actually mean that we're happier over time? Pinger discusses two ways to measure happiness. Since happiness is subjective, you need to ask people how happy they are. You could either poll them randomly and have them note down their mood, or you can ask them how meaningful the last weeks, months, and years have been. And like everything before, yes, people are getting happier. 86% of people say that they're happy or very happy. Also, the richer people get, the happier they get too. There's a common a narrative that money doesn't predict happiness, but it actually does. Turns out when you're not stressed all the time about paying the bills or putting food on the table, you end up being a lot happier. Give me rent. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door. 
And contrary to popular belief, people who win the lottery do end up happier in the long term. Another metric for happiness is suicide rates. Luckily, suicide rates are also down along with depression and anxiety levels. Other than the ones I talked about in this video, other areas of the world is getting better are hunger, inequality, peace, terrorism, democracy, and existential threats. If you're interested in my summary of The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin, where I break down techniques you can use to learn anything, you can watch this video right here. Anyway, thanks for watching, a like would be incredible, and I will see you in the next video.